Welcome to Skeptico, where we explore controversial science and spirituality with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Sakaris, and today we're joined by Matthew Alper, who a few years ago wrote a book, The God Part of the Brain, a book that received a tremendous amount of praise, was very well received, and a lot of people liked it, especially a lot of really smart people like the ones that I'm shown up here on the screen. I was doing um, a radio interview the other day. Here's how this interview came about. There's the show Midnight in the Desert, and I'm talking to the producer beforehand, and she's telling me about this guy who came on the show, and the host was so frustrated. The guy's an atheist, and he's a skeptic, and he's so frustrated that they didn't even finish the interview. And I was like, man, this is my kind of guy. I need to talk to this guy. Well, that's actually a nice way of saying that they hung up on me. Right, said it's the first time. I'm like, what are you hanging up on somebody for? So as you know from listening to the show, folks have listened to it. I love exchanging a lot of ideas. I'm open to especially hashing out things with people who are coming, thing, coming at things from this kind of materialistic perspective, which is the dominant view within science and this God part of the brain thing is something we've certainly talked about a ton on this show. So I thought it'd be great, you know, to have you on and to kind of hash this out and to go over this. So Matthew, thanks so much for coming on. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and about more about the book, The God Part of the Brain? Um, well, I'm not that interesting. So, you know, born, raised in Brooklyn, did some schooling in London, had a bunch of jobs. I was a fifth grade teacher. I worked as a, a sculptor at a claymation studio, uh, made monsters for a living. Then I went back to teaching, taught high school history. Then I bought a book, How to Write a Screenplay, wrote a screenplay, met a producer from Europe at a party, ended up living in Munich while my movie got produced. It was a dystopic science fiction. Um, and then while I was in Germany, I sort of, a light bulb went off in my head and I came up with the concept, the foundation for the God part of the brain. And I decided that's going to be my next thing. I studied philosophy in college. I'd been reading a lot of science and philosophy since I was young. Um, I was, since I came to terms with my mortality, I think I was driven to try to get to the bottom of, you know, is there a spiritual reality? Um, it seemed like most of the world believed there was one. You know, people talked about us all being reunited in heaven and all of that. And um, I don't know, wasn't buying it. Turned out Santa wasn't real and a whole bunch of other stuff. So I said, mm, I'm going to look a little deeper into this. I want to get to the bottom of this particular question. And I thought that the answer would eventually come in some one of the sciences. So I was reading from cosmology down to molecular biology, thinking, leave no stone unturned. I was also experimenting with drugs and meditation, um, thinking, you know, there were a lot of people writing about how different psychedelics were a portal to the other side. Uh, that didn't really get me anywhere, just sort of altered states of consciousness. So, um, so I, I kind of felt like if there was going to be an answer, it was going to be in the sciences. But then after, I don't know, 22 years of, I, well, I was 22 at the time. And I was like, you know what, I've read all the books and I'm getting nowhere. And I just have to accept the fact, like everyone else, that it's just one of those unanswerables. And I guess I'll know when I die or I won't know when I die. So well, while in Germany, um, I, they, they offered me a job there and I was like, all right, I guess, you know, I was going to work on other screenplays living in Munich. It was a beautiful city. And I thought to myself, all right, I guess I've got a job. I've got a career. And I kind of lamented for a moment, the fact that like, you know, I used to be philosophically driven. I had this quest. I wanted to know deeper things. And, you know, I guess I'm just going to be a guy with a job. And I said, you know what, I, I haven't even thought about really anything philosophical 
um, in years. And again, when I was in high school and then college and after college, I was, you know, reading all of the, of, you know, as much as I could of the great thinkers in, in history, the philosophers, um, thinking maybe somewhere someone kind of opened a gateway to an idea in one of their thoughts. Let me just jump in with a quick question, Matthew. At this point, where would you consider yourself like spiritually? Would you identify yourself at this point as an atheist or was that not even, you, you just were like somebody who just was going along with trying to figure this stuff out? No, I would say that I'm probably the most fundamental atheist you can come across. But now you are. I guess I'm now, trying to say back then, would you have back, identified okay, yeah, yeah, if back, someone would have? Yeah, if someone asked me then, I would have said I'm an atheist. But I, but I was, an, but I was, a, but I was a, a frustrated atheist, frustrated in that I didn't believe, but I didn't feel I had a grounding for my disbelief other than it just didn't, it didn't add up. Yeah, this is a bunch of crap, Noah's Ark, this stuff. I'm definitely not well, that. Well, that's I guess religion. I'm an... That's even religion. I, you know, I, I, de- you know I, I felt just by learning all the world's mythologies, I didn't have to debunk each one individually. You know, that Zeus was as likely to be as real as was Jesus or Moses or Muhammad or any of them. So that was easy. Religion was easy. But that doesn't just, even if, you know, the religions got it wrong, that doesn't mean there's necessarily no spiritual reality you know, something that we haven't even come across yet. So that was what I wanted to get to the bottom of, because basically, you know, the question was, I'm either one of two things. I'm either a physical being, which means ashes to ashes, dust to dust, or I'm a spiritual being, which means that even though my body will die, there's a chance that some aspect of myself, my conscious experience will live on, in which case I'm immortal, so I don't have to be as nervous about it. so, but, but I, I considered myself, you know, an atheist, but I, you know, again, like I said, I was frustrated in that it, it felt, it felt empty in that I didn't have so someone who reveres science. I wanted proof of my belief in some form other than just basic doubt. So I'll tell you, you might find this interesting. So when I was in Germany, you know, I kind of like, you know what, I've I, I given up the philosophical life. But before I take this job, I'm going to ask the question one more time. I should probably go back to it, I thought, every five years. Five years will go by, and I'm just going to readdress the question. Have I learned anything? Have I come across anything new that has given me any indication, one way or the other, to believe that I might have some certain knowledge of God? And I was like, you know, no, I haven't seen any miracles. And even if I did, I would have questioned my own perception of them. Have I learned anything that's opened or closed the door one way or the other? I was like, no, I'm back at square one. There's nothing I can say with certain knowledge of God. And then I had my Eureka moment. I was like, wait, there is. There's one thing I can say with certain knowledge of God. It was a odd kernel it's not what i was expecting but i was like it's sitting on the computer screen because i had typed out this sentence i was like it's sitting on the computer screen in front of me there's an empirical fact god is a word i can see it in braille i can touch it if someone says it i can hear it so what can i say with certainty of god that it's a word okay well what does science say about words well it's a human construction something we evolved to have the capacity for Moreover, it's a word that seems to exist or some version of it in every single culture from the beginning of humankind. My next question is, what does science say about universal behavioral patterns? Which takes me to sociobiology, and the answer is, it's because it's inherited. It's wired into the animal, it's instinct. And at that moment, I came up with this idea, Holy crap, it's coming from inside our heads. It's a perception. We're wired with it. And I wrote on a piece of paper, the God part of the brain, and I stuck it on the wall. And I was like, that's going to be my next thing. And it was. And you wrote this book. It's a well-written book. And the book is well-received. So what was that whole process like, real quickly? Sure. Um, I used to be the worst writer alive. As a student, 
Uh, I felt discouraged as far back as elementary school when I was all excited about the creativity of my ideas and the teacher would put red marks all over thing, you know, you didn't capitalize the first letter, you, the punctuation's wrong. So I was like, you know what? Screw writing. I'm good at math and science and all the other stuff. I have a good memory. I won't be a writer, whatever. And I really, I took to that. So that the time I was in high school and having to write papers, I was like, oh man, I screwed myself. This is getting difficult. Like, and my writing was horrible. It really was horrible. Um, and then when I was teaching, when I was a high school history teacher, I was like, I've tried photography. I worked as a sculptor. I've done these different things. I, I felt I wanted to do something creative, but I was like, it started to dawn on me, like the thing that I had always been bad at and felt that I didn't need to know, I'm starting to feel like might be the most powerful artistic medium, which is words. Like, I think I overlooked like the big picture here and missed the bus, but I'm not old and dead. So maybe I should get back on the bus and see if I can learn to write. So I started reading the classics and reading vocabulary and studying language really and punctuation. And then when I came up with the idea, like maybe I'll write a movie when I was teaching high school and bought that book, how to write a screenplay. Um, I thought, well, it's a screenplay. I mean, it's mostly like, you know, Steve and Lisa sitting on a park bench dialogue. Lisa, hi, how was your day? You know, I was like, well, that, I don't really need to be a great writer. I need to be a great storyteller. So I was like, maybe I'll find out, but I think I can pull it off as far as the writing goes. And then I all of a sudden was like, wait, now I'm writing a philosophy tome? So it, whatever you read was after about a thousand edits from beginning to end, starting over, starting over. I self-published. My book was first universally rejected because I have no credentials in neuroscience. So I opened Rogue Press and then I had boxes of books sitting around my apartment and someone's like, well, you got to market it. And I was like, ah, I don't like that stuff. And they're like, well, here's a phone number, send them a press release. Maybe they'll put you on their show. And that was Art Bell. And I guess given the show you do, you're familiar with Art Bell. So 20 minutes later, I get a call, this guy with like the most perfect deep voice. And he's like, we're gonna have you on. I was like, okay. He's like, so how's this date work? I was like, okay. He's like, so you know the drill, right? I'm like, uh, yeah. And I'm like, what, what am I? And What's I the I drill? Up, this Art Bell guy, I'm like, what? Millions of listeners. <laughs> Honestly, when I first got on Art Bell, um, admittedly, I had a few puffs of weed before I went on, but that didn't help. I almost went into a full-blown panic attack. And at one point I was deep into the theory and I was talking about the anxiety function and I have an anxiety attack, but it's on the phone so no one can see me. So I just sort of like held the phone and he's like, hello, are you, are you still there? And for like 20 seconds, I was just like, I was just about to hang up the phone. Like I am over my head. I don't know what I'm doing. And I was like, come on, pull it together, man. <laughs> this could work out. And I got back on the phone and honestly, like he was talking and it was all just like a blur, like wall war. And I was so nervous. And finally I got my bearings and I started talking and then it went really well. And he was only going to have me on for like an hour and he had me on for the rest of the night. And then he replayed that show like a week later. And all of a sudden I'm seeing orders coming in like by the tens of thousands. And my, I, I was ranked for uh, one day. I was ranked on Amazon. I was like the 17th top selling book in the world. I was between Angela's Ashes and Girl Interrupted at the time. This was like 98 when I first wrote this. And I was pretty young at the time. So anyway, the reason I'm saying, so then I start selling books and one of the things people were like, this is amazing. These are original ideas. I love it. However, like, did you get in? Did you have an editor? <laughs> it was still poorly written. I still had a lot to go. Uh, and then I, then all of a sudden I was like, oh my God, I've been sending out this messed up book. Like, I better get in gear. And then I edited and edited. I spent like six months editing 
nonstop, went over the book from beginning to end like 50 times and cleaned it up. And basically I've been cleaning up it, it up since it got sold to source books and then went into numerous languages, went into hardcover. But by that edition, the 2008 edition, um, I haven't touched it since. Honestly, I'm terrified to open it. I'll have a panic attack because I'm a better writer now probably and I'll see a million flaws. I can't even look at it. I'll never open that book again. But, um, but I was told enough times that it was well written. So I was like, and then at one point people were like, great book, you know, da, da, da. they want to talk about the ideas. I'm like, yeah, 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 okay, great book. But what do you think of the writing? Like all I wanted to hear is people say like, oh, it's so well Wow, Matthew, okay. that's, that's, that's amazing. For, for a guy who starts out saying, hey, I'm not very interesting. There's not much to talk about me. You got some amazing stories. I mean, just your whole background. And then that Art Bell and your writing thing for any frustrated writers out there. That's just fantastic stuff. So persevere frustrated writers and read classics and study the way that the, that the greats punctuate and string together their thoughts. And if you persevere, maybe you'll, some of it will rub off on you. Yeah, but buddy, that's not exactly your story. Your story is you just go do it and just do what's next kind of thing. And I think there's, some magic in in that too so i tell you what though let's let's jump off of that yeah and so let's talk about all this stuff i'm obviously coming at this from a very different perspective you know my history is i was really just a, a business guy who got interested kind of like you in the big picture questions who are we why are we here and i kind of felt coming from the opposite perspective, I didn't know for sure, but I felt science maybe has something to offer here, but these science guys seem to be missing the boat given the other science guys that I'm listening to and talking to. So I was kind of like, what gives? Who's right here? And Mm -hmm. that was 10 years ago when I started this podcast. And the podcast, you know, eventually, and then I wrote a book along the way, Why Science is Wrong About Almost Everything, which is kind of like the opposite of your book, which is kind of interesting. And the the premise of my book is that if you get science, if you get consciousness wrong, then you really can't get anything in science right. And that consciousness as, I don't know if you know or not, because I just flashed up on the screen, you know, one of the things that kind of threw me for a loop as I went and did, first of all, the first thing I did when I was going to set up this interview, just so people know there's no sandbagging here. I went and created a thread on my forum. This is like two weeks ago. And I invited you there to look at everyone's posts and stuff like that. But let me play you this quote about consciousness from an interview I did with a very, very uh, smart guy, I think, philosopher, Bernardo Castro, but these are all people you'd recognize kind of coming from your camp, and maybe that will launch us into a discussion about consciousness. These people are just generally regarded as scientists, as the mainstream scientists. And we're talking about Richard Dawkins, Lawrence Krauss, Neil deGrasse Tyson. I mean, Neil deGrasse Tyson, whether we like it or not, is the face of science for uh, many, many, many Americans. So let's see what mainstream science has to say about consciousness. Here we go. I'm going to play this clip. You can see it there. I'm going to play it. But you, but you can say something about the question which you really would wish to know the answer to. And I mean, for, for me, it would be what's, what's consciousness? Oh, because yeah. because that's, that's totally baffling. Well, Richard, you know what I think? I agree. Not that you asked, but what I think on this is uh, consciousness has kind of baffled us for a while, okay? And evidence that we haven't a clue about what consciousness is, is drawn from the in, from the fact of how many books are published on the topic, right? We're not really continuing to publish books, not really, on like Newtonian physics. It's done, all right? So, so the fact that people keep publishing books on consciousness is the evidence we don't know anything about it, because if we knew all about it, you wouldn't have to keep publishing. <laughs> so, so what I wonder, what I wonder, Richard, is 
whether there really is no such thing as consciousness at all, and that there's some other understanding of the functioning of the human brain that renders that question obsolete. To that, I've got to say, like, oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> They're yeah. laughing. I'm laughing like like rolling the aisles laughing. What, what is so funny about that? Of course, that last voice was Bill Nye, the science guy who was up there with him too. What's he was astonished. Bill was astonished. <laughs> it doesn't take much. I mean, the idea that maybe consciousness is not there is probably the weirdest, stupidest idea ever conceived by human thought. I mean, where does thought take place? It takes place in consciousness. So here we have consciousness uh, uh, speculating about the possibility that consciousness does not exist and it may not be there. I mean, the very thought is, is an in-your-face contradiction. And the fact that something like this is not only seriously entertained, but even verbalized by a person with the public exposure of the gentleman we just saw is, is uh, uh, a worrying sign of cultural sickness, uh, a very serious one. It, it... Okay. okay. So maybe I didn't tee that up right, but you get the idea. Consciousness sure. is kind of the fundamental question of this. What do you think? Okay. So, first of all, I don't know why a room full of supposedly important scientists are so confused about what I think is a pretty simple question that I believe has been answered not to its full extent because we do not know the brain fully and probably never will within our lifetimes as, um, however, uh, and I write in the book, I have like a sub chapter, I think called the neurophysiology of the soul. And basically, you know, to me, the question comes down to one of two things, consciousness. Same thing with life, spiritual or physical, physiological. Is it, is it the manifestation of some soulful entity, some ghost in the machine, some transcendental factor that resides within us? Or again, is it a strictly physical entity? My take, and again, I never went to school for neuroscience. I'm not an MD, but I've read a hell of a lot, almost an encyclopedia amount worth of um, science and philosophy. And my take away is that there's all the reason to believe that consciousness is a physiological experience that basically neuroscience slash cognitive science slash neurobiology if it's taught us anything it's taught us that all of that we, all of that makes up what we consider ourselves to be our conscious experience so we've got sensation at the simplest level we feel things we hear things uh we have perception, we absorb the information and make conclusions based on it, and then cognition and emotion, et cetera. So that's the makeup of our being. And then we have memory, so it solidifies, gives us a sense of identity. All of these elements of consciousness can be reduced to various parts of the brain. And what's been shown is when you damage those parts, people suffer aphasias, some debility or deficiency to that aspect of their conscious experience. So like I have people say like, you know, oh, I'm gonna, you know, when I die, I'm gonna be in heaven with my family. So I'll say like, okay, you'll be in heaven. Let's even assume that's true. You're gonna go to heaven. Who you are is going to live forever. You, Joe, is gonna be around for eternity. But then I say, but let me ask, what if, what if Joe gets dementia, Alzheimer's tomorrow, and then you die a year into it, 
where your last self, you know, didn't know whether to, you know, go to the bathroom or eat an apple. You didn't know the difference between the two. You didn't remember the names of your own children, your wife, let alone your own self. So is Joe the demented going to be floating around in this eternal headspace for eternity? Or do you have this idealized version that it's you, Joe, now as you're talking to me? Or maybe is it going to be Joe 10 years ago or Joe when you were five? We're all chameleons. We go through, we're, we're a thousand different people in our lifetimes based on our periods of life. So to me, Hold there on, is, let's, let's pull this apart because we're Okay, let's stacking. pull it apart. Yeah, we're stacking a lot of different things together. And I understand where you're going in terms of the limitations in terms of how people talk about the afterlife and all the rest of that. Mm -hmm. What the, the reason I kind of deconstructed my thing the way that I did is that when you start to me, when you start asking these questions, you keep going further and further into this physicalist kind of question. Other people call it materialism. And so the first thing, you know, because you've kind of studied the philosophy, this is the oldest question kind of in the world. So there's Plato out there saying, hey, there's no physicalism, right? It's all thoughts. It's all ideas. And then you had this other thing. It's like, no, we can break it all down into atoms. And that discussion, argument, ongoing debate continues on to the modern day, right? So if you really look at physics, as we currently understand it is this battle from a hundred years ago between Einstein and Niels Bohr, right? And Einstein is saying, hey, uh, Niels Bohr, you're kind of coming at me with this spooky action at a distance stuff, which is consciousness is fundamental. That's what Niels Bohr is saying. And Einstein's saying, no way, I'm still holding on into E equals MC squared and that M it could stand for materialism. It stands for mass, but it could just as well stand for materialism mm -hmm. because I think there is matter is fundamental. So the question then is, is matter fundamental or is consciousness fundamental? And even Einstein at the end of his life finally has to agree that every experiment that has ever been done in quantum physics has confirmed the reality of the observer effect, has confirmed the reality of uh, spooky action at a distance, of uh, entangled particles, and all that stuff. And I'm going to play one more clip to kind of reinforce that point, because I just interviewed a guy. I think he's a brilliant guy. His, his name is Don Hoffman, Dr. Donald Hoffman. And he's a physicist and as at UC Irvine. And we talked about this very topic. So let me play another clip into you and then we'll, I'll get your, get your view on the whole thing of what I just laid out there. How can science, science as we know it, be so wrong about consciousness? I mean, we're talking about a situation where poll after poll shows that 90% of people in the United States <coughs> completely disagree with this biological robot meaningless universe brain centered idea that we have about consciousness. So the real question I guess I have is how can we really trust science going forward? You're a great advocate of science. You speak eloquently about the scientific method, about how beautiful science is done properly, but I guess I'd turn it around. Can we really trust science when they've dropped the ball so badly already? I agree that the current theories of consciousness among my scientific colleagues really do drop the ball. They, they really start with an unconscious objective reality of space, time, and matter, and they try to boot up consciousness from that. And, and I, you know, I, of course, I disagree with them. I think that that's not the right way to go about it. And, and many scientists still have a feeling that, uh, you know, if that's what spirituality means, then, I'll, then I will have none of it. And the other aspect to it is, is they feel like, look, science made great strides in the, using the assumption that space, time, and unconscious matter are the foundations. And it's, it's truly stunning what's happened in the last three, three and a half centuries. It's, it has completely revolutionized 
um, our understanding of the universe, the technology that's come out has been stunning and it's raised humanity's level of, of life dramatically. So, so there's this feeling among the scientists that look, the physicalist framework was our, our way of getting away from the, the weirdness of the spiritual traditions and, and breaking free. Look what it's, look what it's done. And it, it, it has been dramatically successful. So that's part of where they're coming from. So if I can add just one little piece, because I don't know if I'm making myself clear in all this or not. Physicalism, materialism is just dead. It's a non-issue. Experimentally, it fails over and over again. And this idea that consciousness is fundamental is what wins the day in experiment after experiment. So mind equals brain. Mind, brain is generating consciousness, is just kind of no longer at the table. So what Don Hoffman is saying, he's kind of trying to feel some compassion for Neil deGrasse Tyson and Richard Dawkins mm -hmm. and the rest of these guys who are still tied to this old model that fails over and over again experimentally. So how are you processing all that? Okay, couple comments. So first of all, one of the comments you made um, during that show was that like 90% of Americans disagree with the biological robot model. So first of all, the, the, the opinions of the masses, the mostly uneducated masses, the uneducated masses that gave us the government we have today don't represent to me a valid or viable, if I wanted to put together a new technology, some new type of nuclear missile, I would not say, hey masses, let's, let's, let's think tank on this. I would look for the 0.001% who are diligently spending their lives studying these specific things for my answers. So I, I, I want to just discount the notion that we can say what the, the, the majority opinion represents anything indicative of truth or reason. My next point is we can't necessarily make comparisons to um, paradoxes in quantum realities to consciousness. So the brain, I don't believe, is a quantum experience. The brain is an atomic experience. The brain and all things human basically abide by Newtonian principles. That's what's given us the mechanics of our day is that they work. Gravity still works. Even though quantum realities are real, when you're dealing with subatomic particles, you have a different set of standards than when you have atomic particles. The materialism that comes in atoms. That's just not, that's, you see, that's what I guess Don Hoffman is saying. If you drill into it, that was the view like 20 years ago. But these experiments of like entanglement that you're referring to, they've got them bigger and bigger up to the atomic level, up to the cellular level. They now can even show entanglement that is viewable well, by well, the I don't know when you when you say entanglement what do you mean say define entanglement well, do you understand the idea of quantum entanglement and the observer effect yeah I, I i mean i'm aware of the observer effect um you know schrodinger's cat and all right um and einstein his whole thing of spooky at a, action at a distance right. i mean these are the things that these guys were debating right, right. because okay so first let me let me let me premise also so you know, whatever, whatever debate we have, and you're going to have your beliefs and I'm going to have mine. I can tell you, I've like read these books, thought this through. I am an unyielding materialist. I believe that consciousness is a physical reality. End of story. And I can tell you why I think those things. But, but you I'm don't saying, believe it. You just think that's what the science says, right? Because if the science went against you, then you'd go with what the science is. Or do you have some kind of belief that no, I mean, besides just like sort of it adds up, it passes the common sense test. No, it's validated by what I consider grounded scientific principles. So, and let me just also add this point since we're on the conversation. So you're kind of alluding to that these old models of science are burnt to the ground. They're discarded. We all know better. But who knows better? I mean, to me, that's a fringe element 
the, the skeptics, the believers in various forms of magical thinking that I've come across doing a lot of these radio shows, even someone like Art Bell, to me, UFOlogy is a form of magical thinking. Does that mean I don't believe that aliens exist somewhere in the universe? I absolutely do believe they exist. Do I believe that they've ever visited Earth or ever will visit Earth? No way. I don't believe that's possible within our lifetimes. The nearest star, Alpha Centauri, alone is too far. But again, these are separate. But, but not to digress, because we could get off. But, but, but hold just, on. I mean, yeah. New York Times, 2000, December 2017, it's on the cover that the Department of Defense has acknowledged that they've encountered these UFOs right off the coast here of California. And they'll show you the videos and they operate at levels beyond anything that is explained. whatever whatever you're alluding to i don't i don't personally i don't believe it's real so hold up but how yeah, can you I'm, me, I'm talking well, about the me, new york times i'm talking about you can go watch the videos i'm talking about the department of defense i mean this is relevant in the sense that even if the department of defense decided to release some information like that i don't necessarily even believe that their intention is for all i know it's just to like distract people from something else they really want us not to know. I don't necessarily, until the scientific community at large, the people who are like little weevils trying to dig up information all day long, they exist in the universities around the planet, and that's all they do. They're like weevils digging up information, trying to uncover some new fact. They have, that's all they're interested in. And with all these weevils running around trying to unroot the truth, I still consider what you're talking about fringe elements because you can't, I can go to a university anywhere on earth and I can study biology, physics, chemistry, you name it, all of the various fields of science. None of these sciences will offer me a course in ufology or reincarnation or transmigration of the soul or the study of the soul. Let's study the soul. Oh, I have a PhD in the soul. I got it from Harvard. I took 20 courses all about how the soul is real. The mere fact, to me, that is one of the proofs in the pudding in that all of these weevils who are trying to find the truth, none of them think it's legitimate or valid enough. And not one technology or advancement has come through the belief in what I, all of these various forms of, again, what I call magical thinking. And let me just get to the core point of my book, The God Part of the Brain. What I'm suggesting is humanity is born. We're wired with a lens in our head that basically with, self, with the advent of self-conscious awareness, humans became the most powerful species on earth. It enabled us the power of self-modification. But that one adaptation at the same time had a drawback. It made us aware of our mortalities. So in saying I am, I exist, I don't have to wait a million years for natural selection to give me a thicker coat of fur. I can say I am cold and I can sew myself one, self-modification, most powerful species on earth. But by saying I, I am cold, I also can say I am going to die. And humans become the first animal to experience existential angst. And I believe that in order to help us survive this unique awareness that we have, can you, no, me, can, game you over. Still, can you still? So I believe me? that I said, okay. Well, if I'm going to suggest that there are actually parts of our brain generating these perceptions, I have to have a reason, a rationale, because nothing evolves for no reason. So why would we have evolved this? Now, this is all speculative, but this is what I came up with. I, th I made a list. What makes humans unique? Well, we have, we have language capacities that other animals don't have. We have music abilities. We have math abilities. We have these higher emotions. We have self-conscious awareness. I was like, hmm, okay. That one's actually, I think, the one that's the most unique that makes us stand out the most. And it was as a result of self-conscious awareness that humans became, the, again, the first organism to be aware of their own mortalities, inevitable death. And I believe that the anxiety created by that awareness was so overwhelming, because here for billions of years, you had life on Earth 
dealing with death on a simple mechanism of fight or flee. And we have anxiety built into us, pain functions to make us avoid those things that jeopardize our existence. Suddenly an animal comes in the picture that realizes there's nowhere to run and there's nothing to fight. I could build the biggest castle in the universe. I'm going to die. The anxiety created, the insufferable anxiety created by that awareness, I believe, was so overwhelming that it forced the selection of an evolutionary adaptation, mechanisms in the brain that compel us to believe in some form of a spiritual reality, some form of magical thinking. And it takes place in many different forms, which is why when I hear even scientists debate or people say like, well, this scientist, and they're a PhD and an MD, and they won the Nobel Prize, and they believe in God. So as if that in itself is an argument, and to me, that's not the argument at all. It, to me, it's like, yeah, that makes sense, because the majority of humans are compelled to perceive, to filter all their reality through this spiritual lens, and to justify and come up and jump through somersaults, to come up with ways to justify to themselves what, that these things are real because it's the only way we can survive amidst a mortal experience. But Matthew, that's all good, but it's just kind of your story and you keep kind of mixing in. I believe this, I believe that. And I keep telling you, I just keep going back to the science. So I go back to Don Hoffman, if you want to go back to him, and he will tell you, and we kind of got off the track here, he will tell you there has never been one experiment that's okay. disconfirmed the reality of this consciousness appears to be fundamental. Okay, let me ask you a question. In this, in this con consciousness appears to be fundamental paradigm, simple question. Do you believe in ghosts? Do I believe in ghosts? Yeah. Well, that's, I don't even know what a ghost is. But okay, see, well, then I'll I give you... I'll, then hold I'll on, just hold give on. You. Let me just... Let me go. I'll, yeah. play, I'll play another clip. Because, the, you know, to me, where I went with this is just, okay, if, if there's these really smart people who have reason to believe that consciousness is fundamental, and like you said, I mean, I don't even understand your logic when you say, I'm a materialist. I go, well, I, you're just going to follow the data. And you go, no, I'm a materialist. I'm just going to believe in the material reality. Well, it's like... I mean, then you're not playing it's, science. So when no, I look no, it's at not consciousness... That I, that's what I was on. saying earlier is I believe every aspect of consciousness, perception, sensation, emotion, yeah, yeah, yeah. cognition, you went has been all those. broken Here's down the point. Here's the point. neurophysiological responses. Maybe, but this is that would counter that. If consciousness is fundamental, there's no debate that there's... Then how come if we get banged in the head, our fundamental exactly. consciousness gets skewed? Well, that's what I was just going to say. No one would argue that there is this relationship between consciousness, no matter what it is, and the physical instrument that is processing that consciousness. Okay, the brain. Which is the brain. Okay. So that's what? why I think, so, hold on, Matt, Matthew. So he, let me play this clip because where the research then takes me is then you got to go look, and it's not my kind of choice. It's just where the discussion goes. Well, I'd rather just talk with you referencing other people's su supporting what you're saying. It's not, it's why not, would we not the want to reference. Why would we not want to reference the best experts in the world the, who okay. looked at these questions? Why did we want to just hear two guys that have opinions? And then I thought this, and then I thought that. No, but, but I want to ask you, but I want to know what you're thinking. So you're saying there's the brain, and you're saying, admittedly, the brain plays some role in conscious experience. I'm just curious, wh what do you believe is the origin of the other part? What is the transcendental quality that you believe resides in humans, either in their heads or maybe it's in their toes, wherever it's residing? What is the unknown element that also plays a role? If it's not just the brain, what is the ghost in the machine to you? Well, let me answer that question with another question. Okay. When does consciousness begin? A bunch of questions. When does consciousness end? What is necessary and sufficient to cause consciousness? Who is conscious? Are you conscious? Am I conscious? How do you know? Are animals conscious? Is the cat that's meowing at my door to get in here because she doesn't like getting locked out, is she uh, conscious? So these are the questions and the best 
research out there to begin to even answer these questions is the near-death experience research. And that's the clip we'll play in a minute. But first, I'll give a chance to respond to that. Okay, so I'm responding to what you, what, you rolled uh, out. You rolled out, where does consciousness begin? Where does it end? Does the cat that meows have consciousness? So what, what do you want me to address, all of it? Well, I think they're all, yes, you, you actually okay. heard, heard them perfectly because they're all wrapped into one. When okay. does consciousness begin? When does consciousness end? What is necessary and sufficient to cause conscious okay. experience? So, so I believe that pretty much, I mean, I don't know if I would say a plant, or an amoeba has consciousness. Perhaps it's a, it, it could be defined by the beginnings of those species that first had a ganglia, a collected center for where experiences it comes from. So does the cat have consciousness? Yes. All of these various animals, at least with ganglia and or a brain, I would say have consciousness, do they have self-conscious awareness as part of the experience? No. We'll start with the first one. When does, are, they aware of, are they aware of a world around them? Do they interact with the world around them? Absolutely. Do they have feelings? Do they have sensations? Can they experience pain? Yes. So if that makes consciousness, we're all conscious. However, um, as far as when does consciousness begin, and if I'm assuming that it's true for the cat as much as it is for me, then I would say consciousness begins when ever, I guess, in the embryonic process, when we are developing in our mother's wombs or in an egg or wherever we've evolved from, that basically once the stirrings of a brain and the first stirrings of an awareness Whatever that might be, even maybe maybe most animals, their first conscious experience is hearing their mother's heart if they're if they're a mammal. Yeah, but or, Matthew, you're just kind of wing you're just kind of winging it here, making stuff up. Let me play the reason not really the reason I went to near-death experience research is it gets right to this question. If we can show that consciousness extends beyond a period when we have normal brain function, or I should add, if consciousness survives when the brain is severely compromised in a way that neuroscience can't explain how consciousness could exist, then we have a whole different scenario. We have an answer to your questions and your beliefs that you've said. So that's what I want. And I've interviewed some of the top near-death experience researchers in the world and real near near death experience. Again, I, I know they're out there. I've I've listen, I've been you on don't a have lot any of these of them, you don't have any of them in your book. So let's play Jeff Long. Okay. So, Dr. Long, let me probe a little bit further about the types of near-death experience research that's out there. Because over the years, I've interviewed a lot of near-death experience researchers. And, for example, you know, just the other day, I interviewed this guy, nice enough guy, University of California. He's doing his postdoctorate fellowship. He's part of a team. They received $4 million Templeton Foundation to study near-death experiences. So... I speak to him about his research. Turns out he didn't really do any original research. He didn't go into a hospital, into a cardiac arrest ward and talk to patients there. He didn't, as you did, develop a 150 medical survey and give it to hundreds of near-death experience researchers. Yet he published his results. We talked about his book. He concluded that near-death experiences aren't real in the way that we're talking about. They don't suggest that consciousness seems to survive bodily death. So I guess the question is, for the average person who's trying to sort through this idea of near-death experience science, research, how do they sort through it? How do they know what research really holds up out there? The key thing is to know a few of the consistently seen elements of near-death experience that are the strongest evidence for their reality. For example, when you're under general anesthesia, it should be impossible to have a lucid uh, organized remembrance at that time. Uh, in fact, under anesthesia, you're typically so far under. With general anesthesia, they often have to breathe for you. I mean, you're literally brain shut down to the level of the brain stem. Um, and at that point in time, some people have a cardiac arrest. Their heart stops. And of course, that's very well documented. Uh, they monitor people very carefully that are having general anesthesia. 
So I have dozens and dozens of near-death experiences that occurred under general anesthesia. And at this time, it should be, if you will, doubly impossible to have a conscious remembrance. And yet they do have near-death experiences at this time. And they're typical near-death experiences. They have the same elements and appear to have them in the same order as near-death experiences occurring under all other circumstances. And in fact, a critical survey question I asked was what their level of consciousness and alertness during the experience was. Well, even under general anesthetics, under those powerful chemicals to produce sedation, if they had a near-death experience under general anesthesia, their level of consciousness and alertness was identical to near-death experiences occurring under all other circumstances. There's absolutely no way the skeptics can explain that away. You can fill a, a, a convention center with believers in any religion, any alternate the science that you quoted in your book. I'm okay, not talking, I'm quoted or not quoted you. because of the because of the studies that he did. Not his what studies he are not supportive. Of I also I also are. quote Einstein. I quote lots of people studies, who are believers and all this sorts guy of things. Is still, this guy is still alive, and he's come out and said that that's you, fine. I don't care. He can believe what he wants. Like I said, Niels Bohr, anyone who wants, they can believe. Half of them were, 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 were adherent Christians. Half of them were adherent Jews. They've all believed in their various paradigms. But here's the bigger picture. You could fill a convention center with all of these people who believe, write books showing they're a doctor. They can prove near-death experiences. And yet, and yet, of all of the greater picture, the millions of scientists who represent scientific organizations, you will not find one college, one legitimate college that offers you a degree in near-death experiences. Now, if it was a valid science, I should that's be able just, to major in it like not, I could geology. It's just so are you going to dismiss the... You want it's to just dismiss, not true. You just you, say stuff that you just don't know whether it's true uh, or not. So you can go to the University of Virginia and Dr. Bruce Grayson, and there's plenty of people there that are getting PhDs, and the research is primarily in near-death experience and perceptual studies. And you can go down you're saying, to the You're saying that, you're, you, can you name one college, even in America? I just did. No, no, no. Did. That offers a name, major. Listen, you can get a PhD in whatever you feel like studying. Can you name one college yeah. in America? Whenever, that, you're, whenever you're pushed back, you just kind of just. No, I'm just roll asking you a question. I just said I'm University just of Virginia, and I'll give you another one University of North Texas at Janice Holden. I've interviewed PhD candidates. PhD she, candidates, but you're not answering my question. Can, in any of those schools, can I get a major? <laughs> In near death that's the criteria. That's the criteria. No, I, yeah. I think I think the yeah, way it works. That means it was a validated and accepted validated. For the scientific What's community. Validated is when your PhD is accepted into the broader body of knowledge that is academia, that is Listen, public. If thought. someone offered me half a million dollars for a PhD, I'd say, yeah, you want to get a PhD in two-headed bats with Hitler's brain? Go for it. You can't, you can't do that. You can't get a PhD in two-headed bats. With well, but, but, but apparently you can because people you're saying are getting PhDs in near-death experiences. And to me, that's the equivalent you, of a two-headed bat with Hitler's brain. Well, that's, that's well said on your part, is that to you, they're equivalent. So that is the standard by which you measure it, the Matthew Alper standard of what's real. And I, I, I get that. And there's certainly a lot of people, you know, in your camp. I just... Well, it's not just there are a lot of people in my camp. Why don't you when, feel free when you get off, when we get off the radio to look up, let's just say the top 10 schools in America and ask them, call, call the dean, call the registrar, say, can I get a major? Can I major in near-death experiences? Can I major in reincarnation? Can I major in Jesus? Can I major in Zeus? Can I major in UFO alien technology? Now, you could go to the TV channels and you could watch 50 shows about alien technologies and ghosts. But there's a, nevertheless, there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a distinction between what you can watch on TV, even with MDs and PhDs talking about it, and what you can study in a valid university. Go to medical school and say, I don't want to be an optometrist or a urologist. I want to be a, 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 a near-death experience-ist. And 
you won't get in because it's okay. not real science. Okay. All right. That's, that's, I, I would, I'm just I would. trying to paint a bigger picture than these few specialized voices that anyone can find. I could, like I said, I could find a specialist with a PhD and an MD to tell me about that they can prove the existence of the Virgin Mary, you name it, it's out there. Again, the Loch Ness Monster. Any imaginary thing, there's someone out there with a voice behind it. And that's because humans, the bigger picture is because humans are hardwired to believe in magical thinking. We need to believe that even though the body will die, that somehow consciousness will persevere because without some version of that belief, life is just too freaking painful and devastating for us to get through. And that's, that's for me the final word. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am not gonna add to it because you should be allowed to have the final word. I think these discussions always bring up interesting new points. So I, I do appreciate you coming on, Matthew. Again, the God part of the brain. He said he hasn't touched it since 2008, but I'm sure you'll find it a good read, uh, very well written and a good book. And Matthew, thanks for coming on the show today. Sure. Thanks for having me on. Sorry, I, I know I frustrated you there, but thanks. Oh, thanks. you know, I've just heard this from skeptics all the time. It's like, you know, whack-a-mole. It's the same as arguing fundamentalist Christians, you know. They, if you hit them with science, then that's not good science. If you hit them with something that isn't science, then why aren't you doing science? So it's like you, you, you can't win, but that's people who have fixed beliefs. I don't have fixed beliefs. I go with wherever. I change my mind all the time based on the evidence, but not everybody's like that. All right, I got to run. Anyway, you, I, hope, I hope that'll be in any way satisfying to your listeners. That's all I can hope. So Right on, man. See you. Okay, thank you. Thanks again to Matthew Alper for joining me today on Skeptico. The one question I guess I'd have to tee up from this interview, and it's kind of outside of this interview because I thought his arguments were so pointless, is should we continue to engage with skeptics? Should I continue engage in skeptics and publish interviews and put them out on the Skeptico channel for you to listen to? I, I kind of feel mixed. You know, on one hand, I feel like these people are still out there and still have a lot of credibility with a lot of people, even though their arguments are incredibly silly. I mean, here's someone who I really thought was going to back out of this interview because we did such a thorough job of debunking his nonsense in the skeptical form before he came on. And that was my goal is to kind of drive him away. Don't bring him on the show. Don't waste a lot of time. But he, he comes on anyway, and then he just fails at all these things that we already hashed out in the skeptical form, like he's quoting Dr. Carl Jensen, the ketamine guy, totally misquoting him and misrepresenting him. I mean, you just can't do that if you're serious about this. But it, it just all rolls off the back of these true believers, and that's frustrating, but at the same time, it's kind of worth, I think, putting it out there. And maybe there's a different perspective. Of course, there's a different perspective. And let's hear your different perspective. Hey, by the way, I'd love to get some more traction over there on the Skeptico Forum. It really is a go-to place for me. And I love it when you all join me. As I said, when we were preparing for this interview, there were some great comments there that really helped shape this interview. So if you haven't been over there for a while, please come over to the Skeptical Forum and join me. I'm usually there. I'm usually responding to almost every meaningful post that's there. And I hope you join me over there. Also, I'm going to be working on some new projects over there that I'd really like some audience participation in, in particular, this book that I'm working on. So Richard Cox from the Deep State Consciousness podcast has actually agreed to kind of help me corral some of this in. So you'll see him and I posting over there. And we'd really like to have you come over there and join us because this audience, this narrow audience that decides to dive deeply into this stuff is really important to this work that I'm doing and trying to move forward. So that's my, that's my plea there. Please come over to the Skeptical Forum and join me. By the way, you can also, of course, check out the Skeptical website. All the past shows are there. Download them, use them, share them, and stay with me. I have a number of 
I think, really good interviews coming up. I'm really excited to bring them to you. So stay with me for all of that. Until next time, take care and bye for now. Mm -hmm.